with candlelight in the Emma Lake darkness, one room cabin near Grey Owl's haunt. I find my voice in the night of owl calls, fish rise, leaves shake, the deer graze outside my door. You will find your voice, you have found your voice, you are your voice. Stiff paper bark, thank you Mother Birch, for your body provides our words. People, real people, the people, all had literacy long before contact, all entities had voice. Contact began the long, dark struggle back to voice through nameless darkness, through gruesome torments and torturous existence, caught in the in-betweens of life, death, and other. Other turned into dreaming and the realization of place and the discovery of space through time. You have found your voice. First the loon told you, then the wind, then the geese in Niska Besem, then Kakakeo told us all. The wind blew life into your lungs and sang a song from your throat, and you sang your song with your voice. It was your song. It was always sung and just is. Traveler, there are no roads. The road is created as we walk it. To travel from colonization to decolonization on the river of new old thoughts, we must first load the canoes. Our canoes must go far and carry quite a load from which we will actually use up while we travel. The loads will be absorbed by our minds and leave us again in the form of knowledge. This river flows both ways and we will pass canoes coming and going. Eventually, we will all meet. This paper pertains to the journey that begins with the ethnocentric statement by 17th century political philosopher Thomas Hobbes describing Aboriginal people's lives as nasty, short, and brutish. Modern European political thought has its roots in the state of nature theory propounded by Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes' vision of the state of nature remains the prime assumption of modernity, a cognitive vantage point from which European colonists can carry out experiments in cognitive modeling and engineering that inform and justify modern Eurocentric scholarship and systematic colonization. I will attempt to show by quotations paraphrasing and by examples that positive change is coming. By re-educating our education systems, educators and communities, we will renew place in the world. This will be no small task. On this journey, I propose that if we pack our canoes well, we will succeed. Let's start with these three bundles, knowledge of place, relearning Aboriginal language and culture, knowledge of space, ethical space, where we engage and respect one another's knowledge and life force, and knowledge of time. We don't have much time left to initiate the space in ethical engagement. I see that we have already packed Hobbes' state of nature. Well, thanks, Sagage, for that one. Let's check out the rest of the load and get started. I'm ready to go packing our canoes. To continue on with our metaphorical journey, we must find out how to balance our weight. So in order to do that, I had to find out what everyone wanted to put in their packs. Any community going out in the land needs to first balance their canoes. Let's see what the people want to pack. Louise is taking this poem. Leaf, life, laughter, sun. Mimikwesisak astam. Loving, laughing one. I have chosen art books for my pack and some other books of skill a drawing set, paints, and paper. The art books are varied, each one very inspirational. I feel like each of the artists is in my canoe. I have a conversation with one of them as we paddle along. Right now, there's only the two of us, the canoe and the water. We are very creative at the House of Invention. Artists go there by themselves or stumble across it, voluntarily go or go, and they don't remember when they wake up as well. Writers go there, and musicians of all kinds go there, and pick up their sheet music, which they play when they are awake. 
None of these people relied on any particular person to inspire them or to give credit to any particular person alive to say, well, this is what I've learned from this person. What they did was go directly to the house of invention themselves. I listen. Who am I to talk when the great Norval Morso speaks? I think instead, and the long pause between his words and what I will say feels right. I am respectful, thoughtful, internalizing his words. I want to be an artist. I want to feel good about myself. I want to inspire others to feel good about themselves. Maybe that's the artist's and the musician's job. Where can I find this house of invention? I believe that when I sleep, I get out of my body and I roam all the universe. I go to the inner places. I go to the source. I even dare to say I go to the source where all the inventors of mankind go, to the house of invention. Norvell and I are both out of our systems, out of our artificialities in my metaphorical canoe, going down the new old river to relieve our colonialist burdens. Already my pack feels lighter, even though I'm filling it with this great artist's teachings. I am entering Norvell's knowledge space, and I am learning. These paintings only remind you that you're an Indian, inside somewhere. We're all Indians. So now when I befriend you, I'm trying to get the best Indian, bring out that Indianness in you to make you think that everything is sacred. What I teach the people is that attitude and attention will determine the whole course of our lives. Get rid of fear, and that is all you ever have to get rid of. Fear of anything at all. There's nothing to fear but fear itself. Oh no, I just dumped all that old colonialist baggage into the water. Are you saying that I shouldn't fear the fact that I'm colonized? Or are you saying that even without decolonizing, I can carry on as long as I am brave? I do feel lighter. New music is very healing, for healing things for people. So we allow ourselves to become instruments or channels for the inner master or spirit so that we may inspire others. I agree. Sometimes the best teaching is done from example. You are a wise man. You are a painter. You have inspired many younger artists to realize that everything is sacred. Eh, hey, hey. Yes, that is what you have inspired them to do. A lot of people tell me that I must be the happiest person there is. I believe that. That's how I managed to live all this life. Saskatchewan. That's why the river widened out. We're in Treaty 6 country. Let's see if someone from my Treaty Elders of Saskatchewan will come out and paddle. The elders emphasize the sacredness of the earth, and in particular the sacredness of the people's island, North America, that was given to their peoples to live on. The elders say that the Creator gave the First Nations peoples the lands in North America. The elders maintain that the land belongs to their peoples as their peoples belong to the land. What's this? I see teepees in a camp right on the river. Let's stop for a bite to eat and ponder that last statement by Cardinal and Hildebrand. Then we'll make the miles, because I now have all the treaty elders of Saskatchewan and the authors in my little canoe. Hey, move over. What was that you said about ethical space? Ta ta wow, ta wow. There's room. We carefully steer our he heavily loaded canoes towards the shore. We are greeted by the community of Sturgeon Lake First Nation, who are having a wonderful meal of ribs, berries, and bannock at their annual summer youth camp. What an inspiration for us all as we join them. We're careful not to unload any of our baggage in this sacred place, as the words spoken in the canoe come back to us, that the land belongs to their peoples, as their peoples belong to the land. We journey on after settling back in our canoes on our journey to decolonization on the new old river of knowledge. We rest for a moment at a still part, and my paddle lays across the canoe walls. The silence is powerful. Cheryl Swidrovich has found her voice. The phonetic syllabic characters were first introduced to the Cree at Norway House by Methodist minister Reverend James Evans. Apparently, the invention was quickly carried to the distant camps and created a considerable sense of excitement among the Indians to whom it was introduced. The fascination with syllabics appears to have had particular relevance to the spiritual customs and beliefs of the Northern Cree. 
Now, isn't that interesting? Can Cheryl be saying that there are some good things in my pack from colonialist times? Were syllabics instrumental in collaboration, communication between Aboriginal nations over long distances and times? Wow, who'd have thought of that? I'd better be careful and only throw out what I can't use. I was feeling heavy colonialist guilt for all my colonialist ways. But hey, isn't guilt a colonialist thing brought in by the Christians? I'm learning a lot on this trip. Hi, hi, Tabwe. That's why we are all on this journey. Boy, that Sturgeon Lake First Nations really hit the nail on the head with all the things they are doing to syncretize their traditional ways and knowledge with the new ways that they decided not to throw out. Decisions are hard to make, especially for an entire community, nation, or people. Okay, if we carry this idea further, that means we all share epistemic duty towards humanity and life, right? However, I have argued that most of the evil produced by humans is not the result of malicious intentions, but the unwillingness to do one's moral and epistemic duties. I'm going to put you back in my pack, Mark. I like your book, The Philosopher and the Wolf, but since reading Hobbes, I'm afraid I'm a little down on philosophy. What? I should learn to take the good from all the knowledge I find in my pack? How do I tell if it's good? How do we find wholeness? Wholeness is like a flower with four petals. When it opens, one discovers strength, sharing, honesty, and kindness. Together, these four petals create balance, honesty, and beauty. Wholeness works in the same interconnected way. The value strengths speak to the idea of sustaining balance. But I'm all wet and cold from that last dip in the new old river of knowledge that I could really use a warm-up by the fire and a good night's rest. Let's pull up over there by the sandbar. Hey, Dalvin, did you bring your drum? I could use a good song to balance me out. I'll light the fire. Darn, my matches are wet. So we leave our travelers to have a good night's rest and find out what kind of sleep they've had when we join them again in the morning. Dalvin has already taught everyone one hoop dance that sure warmed them up. The fire was a little hard to light with the wet matches, but someone had an old-fashioned colonialist lighter, so they started a syncretic flame, and that's when the drumming and singing really got going. The entire area joined in the celebrations of, we made it this far, and afterwards everyone slept like logs. It's all a question of story. We're in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. Dream time, such a conduit to the other, to the spiritual planes, to the house of invention. Where is our world going when most of the population has no time to dream? When we dream, we base our dreams on our epistemology. When we tell our stories, we develop tales relating to our epistemic duty, moral implications that help us understand our boundaries and imaginings as a culture. Our language allows us to further our dream experience and deepen our meanings in our stories. We are no longer a flat plane, but an entity, a whole, a sentient commodity capable of limiting our excesses and broadening our horizons. On this canoe trip, we've developed really messy packs. With any journey, one quickly grabs what one needs and throws back the unwanted and unneeded in a hasty, sometimes careless manner. The arrangement becomes entangled, messy, and inefficient. We eventually get so that we can't find what we need when we need it. And when we do, it's usually so damaged or wrinkled that we can't use it. The pack actually begins to smell, and that's when we finally get the message to do something about it. Wade Davis, in his book The Wayfinder, coins a term to describe the oneness or whole of the language, cultural, and spiritual diversity on our earth. He calls this social web the ethnosphere, and believes that it is humanity's greatest legacy. The ethnosphere of education, coupled with the development of syncretic teaching techniques, could become the classroom of tomorrow if we dream the way today. As my dad always said, even the little prairie chickens dance. Dance your dance in your own way, but dance. The sacred river flows both ways, and canoes pass each other coming and going. We will all eventually meet. <laughs>